Growing up in the Pacific Northwest, you become accustomed to a few things. One, the Seattle Mariners breaking your heart every year. Two, rain, or rather, nine straight months of dark skies accompanied by a light drizzle. And three, your hometown being linked to a countless number of true crime stories. I grew up in the town of Puyallup, Washington, which is now a decent-sized town in its own right. But back in the mid to late 1990s, Puyallup was little more than a suburb on the outskirts of Tacoma, the third largest city in the state, but one that is always hidden in the shadows of Seattle. To many, Tacoma is just Seattle's seedier younger brother, a city that's been unable to shake its rough reputation from decades prior. When I was a child, Tacoma was a town that had gained fame for being the home of one of the largest gangs on the West Coast, the Hilltop Crips who sparred with other gangs in the area as well as local law enforcement. They even got into a notorious gun battle with U.S. Army Rangers in 1989 which became known as the Ash Street Shootout. Because of these links to gangs and other violent crime, Tacoma would cultivate a reputation as a dangerous place throughout the late 1980s and 1990s. Add to that the almost infinite number of serial killers that lived in the region. Ted Bundy, the Green River Killer, the number is endless. By the turn of the millennium, Tacoma had started to turn a corner and is now regarded as one of the better cities in the U.S. to live in and raise a family. But even I remember what it was like just a couple of decades ago, especially in the area known as the Hilltop, where the Crips once reigned supreme. Nowadays, with all of the former Crips incarcerated or dead, the Hilltop has been able to recover and is now a thriving residential area. By 1999, Tacoma had started to become the city it is today, no longer just Seattle's troubled younger sibling, but a full-fledged city with its own identity. In the years since, Tacoma has mostly managed to shed its Tacompton nickname, but like all harder nicknames, it would take time. The reason I'm telling you this is because, as a child, I grew up fearing the city of Tacoma. Not just because of these gang connections or the serial killer stories, but because of another incident that occurred in my youth. About a year after I moved to the region, when I was just eight years old, a story began to unfold that made regional headlines and would begin to instill a fear of strangers within me. I would remember hearing coverage of this story on the evening news, a little girl being abducted from a bowling alley, just feet away from her loved ones, never to be seen again. This would become a cautionary tale for other kids my age that lived in the Pacific Northwest, and has probably contributed significantly to me setting down on the path that I'm now on, where I cover true crime for a living. This is the story of Tika Lewis. Tika Latrice Lewis was born on July 4th, 1996, to her parents Teresa English and Robert Lewis. Teresa had four other children, including a sister for Tika that was born about a year and a half after her, but unfortunately her father Robert would not be a large part of Tika's early life having been convicted of theft and sentenced to four years in jail. Tika was a multiracial child, having black, white, and Native American ancestry. Her father, Robert, was black, and her mother, Teresa, was part Chippewa Native American. As a child, she would be treated for asthma and allergies at Indian Health Practitioners, a nationwide clinic made available for Native Americans, which operates a tribal health authority in nearby Puyallup. Unfortunately, Tika did not get to spend much time with her family, at least not as much as she should have, in order to develop her own personality and show off her true self to her loved ones. But in her brief amount of time with her loved ones, Tika would begin to grow into a loving and caring child who doted upon her younger sister and constantly clung to her mother. Tika was described as a shy and quiet kid who did not like to be picked up by people she did not know, or even people she barely knew for that matter. Her mother, Teresa, would later recall that she cried when aunts and uncles tried to pick her up or hold her. Speaking to the Seattle Times, Teresa stated, She wouldn't go outside on her own. She's a mama's girl. She sleeps with me and her blankie. And if I'm not there, she's crying. And if she doesn't have her blankie, she's crying. 
On January 23, 1999, Tika's family would gather at New Frontier Lanes, a bowling alley located along the 4700 block of Tacoma's Center Street, located between the Oakland and Fircrest neighborhoods. This is just a few blocks away from Tacoma Community College, and is also just a stone's throw away from Shaney Stadium, where the Tacoma Rainiers, the Seattle Mariners' AAA affiliate, plays. That Saturday, which was a league night at the bowling alley, was a busy night for the establishment. In addition to dozens of people gathering inside of the bowling alley, the parking lot was at capacity. Nearly a dozen of Tika's relatives would gather in the bowling alley that evening, occupying lanes 7 and 8 out of the 32 available. This would put them relatively close to the center of the bowling alley itself and allowed them to keep sight of Tika, who kept wandering back and forth from the bowling alley's arcade. She had been initially drawn to a coin-operated claw machine, unsuccessfully trying to win a teddy bear, but one of her uncles would help her win the bear, which she then gave to her 10-month-old baby sister. However, she would keep going back and forth to the arcade, beating the machine's coins that she stored in a clear purse that she carried, a child's purse with a fish design, which she had just purchased with some Christmas money. Inside of the purse were quarters for the arcade and several Starburst candies, which were her favorite. Teresa, Tika's mother, says that she last saw her in the arcade, just feet away from a side exit, playing a Cruisin' World racing game at around 10.15 p.m. At that point, Teresa and her family members had been switching between supervising Tika and bowling, and Teresa would recall ducking out for just a moment to check in on her brother, who was bowling. Within these vital seconds, something would happen. Dawn, Teresa's sister, would later tell reporters, It must have been 10 to 15 seconds that she looked away. It was that close. Someone had to have been watching. When Teresa turned her back to check in on Tika, she could not find her. There was nothing where the two-year-old had been just seconds prior. Teresa would begin to check in between the individual arcade games, hoping that Tika was just playing hide-and-seek with her, and would then begin frantically scanning through the crowd of people in the bowling alley that night, young and old alike. Speaking to reporters later on, Teresa herself would later recall, I turned my head for less than a minute and she was gone. Someone had to pick her up and run out the door. She's a mommy's girl. She wouldn't wander off. Almost immediately, friends and family of Teresa and Tika would begin to scour the premises for the missing child, with people in the lanes next to them recalling that these loved ones would search through every nook and cranny of the bowling alley itself. One of the first places that Teresa would check was the nearby bathroom, where she hoped Tika had run off to. Inside of the bathroom, however, was a cousin of hers, who was changing her own baby's diaper, and she had not seen Tika. Just outside of the bathroom, Teresa would encounter an off-duty police officer who would begin searching the property alongside her. Together, they would alert the bowling alley staff that a child was missing and ask them to not only check in the employee-only section of the building but make an announcement over the intercom. Staff members would make an announcement about a missing child moments later, but it did not seem to make much of a difference. Many of the people inside just continued on bowling. A panicked search to find the missing youngster would begin to unfold in and around the bowling alley that evening, including in the exterior surrounding it. With it being January in western Washington, the temperature was just above freezing that night, and it was not believed that Tika would have wandered off outside on her own. Not only was she without a coat, but she was afraid of the dark and would not have gone outside without her mother. Unfortunately, nobody inside the building had seen or heard Tika cry out, and no trace of her would be found that evening. Her family, Fearing that the worst had happened, reported Tika missing at approximately 10.30 p.m. that Saturday. Officers with the Tacoma Police Department would arrive at the New Frontier Lanes bowling alley that Saturday evening, and would unsuccessfully search for Tika Lewis over the next several hours. At first, they believed that the child had wandered off on her own, but as the hours began to pass without any sign of her, they began to grow concerned that she had been potentially abducted. By the following morning, Tika would be listed as endangered missing, and police would announce that foul play was suspected. According to Lieutenant Jim Howitson, who spoke to the press that Sunday, we don't know the circumstances. She could have gotten into a car to get warm and been driven away unintentionally, or she could have been taken. But it appears she did not walk away on her own. We are expanding our investigation beyond the search area. 
Over the next several days, Tacoma PD would be joined by members of the FBI, as well as NICMEC, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, who would help them canvass the neighborhood and conduct searches throughout the area. They would even begin probing wooded areas nearby, bringing out a helicopter armed with a infrared device using it to scan for any heat signatures that might match the missing toddler. They would even bring out search dogs to help sniff out where Tika might have gone, and this would ultimately lead to one of the first major discoveries in this case. On Tuesday, January 26th, Nearly three days after Tika went missing, two search dogs would independently lead investigators to a brushy area across the street from the bowling alley. There, police would discover a pile of men's clothing, which had been compiled into a ball and seemingly stashed or discarded under a bush. Because none of the items of clothing had mold or mildew on them, a near certainty for clothing left outside in misty Tacoma, Washington in the middle of winter, it was believed that they had not been there long. These items were described as a navy blue wool peacoat with IS or JS written on the back label, off-white Lee brand jeans, which were initially described as docker style pants and a Columbia brand button-down plaid shirt. When asked to comment about this discovery, police would not shed any more details, but the spokesman for Tacoma Police, Jim Matthias, would admit, at this point, the clothing is evidence. Within the first week of this investigation, investigators had successfully ruled out the members of Tika's family as suspects in her disappearance, including her two parents, Teresa and Robert. While Teresa had been at the bowling alley on the night of Tika's disappearance, she did not have a motive to carry out this crime, nor the means to do so, and would be subjected to two separate polygraph tests to clear up some discrepancies with her testimony. Police were initially skeptical of her because of her calm nature. Meanwhile, Tika's father, Robert, was incarcerated at McNeil Island Correction Center for a theft conviction at the time of Tika's disappearance. Other family members and close friends would be cleared of suspicion early on, with Detective Larry Lindbergh stating, there isn't any evidence the family had anything to do with it. The more that investigators learned about this crime, the more they began to suspect that this was a rare case of stranger abduction. At the time, approximately 354,000 children were reported missing each year, and of those, only 4,000 were linked to people outside of their close family, neighbors, family, friends, etc. Of those 4,000, only two to 300 missing children's cases were proven to have been committed by a total stranger, just to give you an idea of how rare this was, even for the time. Tika's mother, Teresa, would initially suspect another woman that had been at the bowling alley that evening, who she recalls asking to hold a relative's baby and displaying some odd behavior. But police would state that this woman's whereabouts were accounted for throughout the evening, and they had no reason to suspect her of any involvement. Involvement. However, they would state that anybody in or around the bowling alley would continue to be investigated. In the weeks to come, investigators would hear from two separate witnesses who reported some odd behavior from people in or around the bowling alley that evening. One came from a female witness who told police about a maroon Pontiac Grand Am, which came careening out of the bowling alley's parking lot on the night of Tika's disappearance. At the time, the Pontiac was speeding and nearly hit the woman who later told police about this brief but alarming encounter with the vehicle, which then fishtailed out of the parking lot. This witness believed that it had been a four-door version of the vehicle, and possibly a late 1980s or early 1990s model, with dark tinted windows and a large spoiler. The second witness was a teenage boy that had been at New Frontier Lanes on the evening of Tika's disappearance, who reported seeing a suspicious-looking man near one of the bowling alley's exits. He says that this man appeared to be following a child. According to the witness, this was described as a white man in his 30s with shoulder-length brown hair, facial pockmarks, a mustache, and what the teenager described as a big fat nose. At the time, this individual was wearing a blue checkered flannel shirt and jeans. This witness sighting in particular would become relevant later on, when additional witnesses came forward with stories of their own, reported run-ins with a troubled man matching the same description. In the weeks, days, and hours leading up to Tika Lewis's disappearance, 
at least one man had been attempting to abduct young children in the area. This man seemed to match the description of someone seen by witnesses in the bowling alley on the night that Tika went missing. This man seems to have struck for the first time on November 29th, 1998, approximately two months before Tika went missing. However, he was reported to have been in the same location that Tika was last seen, New Frontier Lanes. On the evening in question, a Sunday, a man had attended a bowling league event with his four-year-old son, who, like Tika, spent most of his evening in the arcade. However, that evening, he had gone off to the bathroom, and minutes later, another patron would head into the bathroom, finding the boy laying on the floor of a stall, having been sexually assaulted by a stranger. The man from this incident was described as a white man with curly brown hair and a beard, who was possibly wearing a hat with the word husky on front, implying a link to the nearby University of Washington, whose team name is the Huskies. Unfortunately, this incident was not reported to police until the following day, due to a miscommunication between the child's father and the bowling alley's security guards, who were sure that they had seen the culprit at the bowling alley before, but did not know his name. Then, about a month and a half after this, just a few weeks before Tika's disappearance, another startling incident had unfolded at the same bowling alley. And again, this story seems to have originated in the arcade room. A family was spending a Saturday night at New Frontier Lanes, and their six-year-old son had been playing video games in the arcade by himself. Like Tika, the boy's mother was checking in on him regularly throughout the evening. At one point, the mother looked up and saw a strange man bent down near her son, holding onto his hand. As she quickly approached the arcade area, she heard that the strange man was claiming to be the boy's father, which he clearly was not. She would know. The mother began confronting this strange man and called upon the alley's security guards who escorted the man from the building. The mother would just assume that police had been called by the security guards, but as that happened from the prior case in November, they weren't. After learning about Tika's disappearance just a few weeks later, someone would call in a tip to Tacoma police about this attempted abduction, and would put police in touch with the boy's mother. She would recount this incident to investigators, and was surprised that no police report had been filed, similarly describing her son's attempted abductor as a white man with brown hair. Then, on the same day that Tika went missing, a man matching the same general description was seen in a park nearby, less than a mile away from the bowling alley. A father had taken his two kids to Oakland Madrona Park that Saturday afternoon, and recalled that his children went to the bathroom together at around 2 p.m. A few moments later, this father would spot a strange man near the bathroom, who seemed to be attempting to lure his children away. At least, he was physically motioning for the two kids to go with him. This father would begin to chase the man off and reported that the man sped off in what looked like a blue 1995 Pontiac Grand Am, which had been parked nearby. In this case, the father would not report this incident to police for approximately three days, at least not until he learned about the disappearance of Tika Lewis on the news, a case that had unfolded just hours after this reported run-in and approximately three quarters of a mile away. The man he described to police was also a white man with brown hair who was wearing a baseball cap at the time. While it's possible that these were all unrelated incidents, the fact that the potential offender matched the same general description and attempted to abduct children from the same neighborhood leads me to believe that this was just one man. Investigators seem to think that they might be linked as well, with Detective Lindsay Wade saying to the News Tribune's Stacey Mulek in 2012, I can't say for certain if all these incidents are related, but there's a possibility that they are, given the Pontiac Grand Am. In the same interview, Detective Wade stated, In a lot of abduction cases, these guys will make several attempts before they are successful. They will get involved in incidents like exposing themselves or luring. Since none of these cases have been cleared by police in the decades since, it leads me to believe that one man had been attempting for months to abduct a child from the same general area that Tika disappeared in. At the same time that she went missing, these attempted abductions seem to have come to an end. Perhaps this man had succeeded in one abduction and then moved on, maybe to another region. Now, we're going to pause for just a moment to hear a word from today's sponsors. Today's episode is also brought to you by Simply Safe. 
There's almost always a rise in break-ins during the holidays. This is why Simply Safe Home Security is having a huge holiday sale. US News and World Report recently named Simply Safe the best home security of 2020. And now you can save 30% off of any Simply Safe system and get a free security camera in the process. I honestly love Simply Safe. I'm not just saying that as a plug for this ad, but my least favorite part of dealing with security companies is the pushy salespeople and having other people come into your home to set it up. Simply Safe takes both out of the equation and lets you order directly from them on their website and lets you set up everything yourself. Just plug and place all of the sensors, cameras, monitors, and whatever else you want to use. Their systems are customizable and easy to set up. It's a win-win. You can now get 30% off of your Simply Safe order and a free security camera by visiting simplysafe.com slash unresolved. This is a limited time offer that expires soon, so please take advantage of it as soon as possible. Once again, that offer can be found at simplysafe.com slash unresolved. Now, let's return to the show. In April of 1999, just a couple of months after Tika's disappearance, the Tika Lewis bill would be passed in Washington state, creating a multi-agency task force within the Washington State Patrol. This task force would augment local and regional police when they were dealing with reports of missing or exploited children, and could be mustered together in emergency situations, such as Tika's. In the months that had followed the disappearance of the two-year-old, police had attempted to link the witness sightings they had obtained, of both the pockmarked man seen in the bowling alley, as well as the repeated sightings of a white man with brown hair who may have been seen driving a Pontiac Grand Am to registered sex offenders in the area. It's unknown how successful they were in finding individuals that matched this description, but months would pass without police naming a suspect or person of interest nor finding any sign of the missing child. For weeks, police had held out belief that Tika's body might be found in the area around the bowling alley. Speaking to the media, Tacoma Detective Larry Lindbergh stated, If you talked to a hundred police officers, they would all probably say she's dead. They would say she's near the bowling alley somewhere. We just haven't found her. In particular, a large contingent of officers seemed to believe that Tika's body had been abandoned on a property nearby the bowling alley, adjacent to it, which was scheduled to be excavated for development later that year. However, when the excavation was carried out, much to their surprise, no sign of Tika was found. Months would begin to pass without any sign of Tika Lewis. Before long, more than a year had gone by, and the youngster's name would begin to disappear from local news headlines. It wasn't until the spring of 2001 that Tika's case would be reported upon once again, more than two years after her disappearance. On April 28th, 2001, the body of a headless child was found in Missouri, who would later become known as Precious Doe. This girl, who appeared to have been around four years old at the time of her death, was found in a wooded area just outside of Kansas City, and had clearly been a victim of homicide. Her head was found wrapped in a plastic trash bag about 200 yards away from her body, and an ashtray, one of the murder weapons, had been left near her body. Police would begin to link the two cases together, since Tika was one of the few missing black girls that matched the description of the female victim, and their ages would correlate. Tika had been missing for two years, and would now be four years old, the estimated age of this victim. However, DNA tests performed in May of that year would prove that Tika was not Precious Doe, and approximately four years after that, Precious Doe was identified through DNA testing as Erica Michelle Marie Green. Police would discover that her stepfather and mother had conspired to kill her and dispose of her body, and they were both later sentenced to life in prison and 25 years, respectively. This would bring an end to that grisly story, but not the enduring mystery of Tika Lewis, which remained unexplained nearly a decade later. By 2006, a $27,000 reward for information was being offered by Tacoma Pierce County Crime Stoppers, and while investigators were still actively receiving tips, the investigation had reached a virtual standstill years earlier. However, that same year, inspired by another news story from out of state, Tika's name would make headlines yet again. It was announced in 2006 2006 that a private investigator hired by Tika's family had found a girl living in a Dallas, Texas RV park who seemed to match the profile of the missing girl. Not only did this girl look incredibly similar to Tika and her sisters, who were now 8 and 15 years old respectively, but according to Teresa, this girl had the exact same earlobes. 
Speaking to the News Tribune, Teresa stated, The minute I saw the picture, my heart told me it was mine. In my heart, this is my daughter. Photos were sent back to Teresa, which apparently showed this girl in the care of a woman that she supposedly recognized from the bowling alley, claiming that she had seen this woman there on the night of Tika's disappearance. However, the FBI would assert that this girl was not related to Tika in any way, with Melissa Schuler, the spokeswoman for the FBI field office in Seattle, telling reporters, It's fairly certain that this is not Tika Lewis. Even though Schuler admitted that the girl from Texas was a virtual lookalike, she said that there were enough differences to rule out a comparison, including birthmarks, which the girl in Texas did not have, but stated that DNA test would make the ultimate determination. It would take several weeks for the results from the DNA test to come back, but when they did, they came back as a negative match. Despite the similarities, this was not Tika Lewis. During this period, several attempts would be made to link Tika's case to others from the region. Among the most prominent were the disappearance of Lenoria Jones, a three-year-old that went missing from Tacoma in July of 1995, the murder of 10-year-old Adriana Jackson from nearby Tillicum, who was murdered in December of 2005 and whose body was found months later in April of 2006. Then there was the murder of 12-year-old Zena Linick, a 12-year-old Ukrainian immigrant who was abducted from her home in Hilltop, Tacoma, and then murdered. In each of these cases, police would attempt to link Tika's case through one factor or another. However, despite each of these three cases bearing some similarities to Tika's disappearance, it's unlikely that any of them are linked. In the case of three-year-old Lenoria Jones, who similarly disappeared from a public place in Tacoma, her guardian at the time is believed to have been involved, changing her story numerous times and having an alibi that was easily disproven by police. When it came to 10-year-old Adriana Jackson, she was last seen walking through an area frequented by drug users and transients, and very little information has ever been learned in her case. Then finally, in the case of 12-year-old Zena Lenick, we know who killed her, a 42-year-old immigrant from Thailand named Terapon Adon, a convicted rapist and sex offender from the area, who has since been linked to additional rapes of teenagers and preteens from the region, including the murder of Adriana Jackson from December of 2005. While Adon actually made for a valid suspect in this case, I actually wrote an entire section about him that I'm omitting from this episode. I do not believe that he's a match for Tika's murder for one simple reason. He never targeted girls younger than 11, and I don't think he would have been able to abduct a two-year-old from a public bowling alley without being seen. In the research for this story, I have found several sex offenders that lived in the Tacoma region at the time, and had a prior history of not only targeting young girls, between the ages of 2 and 7, for sexual purposes, but also had a history of violent and controlling behavior. Unfortunately, this is an exhaustive list, and it would be virtually impossible for me to disseminate this information in a thoughtful and responsible manner. Needless to say though, there are a lot of potential sex offenders living in the area who feasibly match the profile of Tika's abductor. In the years after Tika's disappearance, the scene of the crime, the new Frontier Lanes bowling alley, would be demolished. Where it once stood is now a Home Depot, located next to a jack-in-the-box fast food restaurant and a Harborstone credit union. Police would receive more than 700 tips in the first few years after Tika went missing, and would end up investigating leads in several states. The case would even be featured on several true crime television shows, including America's Most Wanted, which aired segments on Tika at least three times throughout 1999. In 2008, police would begin releasing additional photos and videos of Tika in an effort to raise awareness for her case, as well as the $27,000 reward being offered by local Crime Stoppers. The following year, 2009, Tika's face would be plastered on the side of semi-trucks driving throughout the United States, which was part of a joint effort between the Washington State Patrol and Gordon Trucking, called the Homeward Bound Program. During a vigil held on the 11-year anniversary of Tika's disappearance in 2010, a man would tell Tika's mother, Teresa, about a vision that that he had about the still-missing girl, claiming that he knew where she was. 
Teresa, who had never seen this man before, said that what the man told her was unnerving enough, to the point that she forwarded this information to Belize, who began looking into the man and his claims. Following through on the information received, police would conduct a search at nearby Point Defiance Park, digging up a roughly 8 by 12 foot area of ground in the native gardens. They would not find anything during this dig or subsequent searches of the area, and would later arrange to speak to the man, who was only described as being in his 40s and living in the Puget Sound. Since he wasn't being arrested or charged with any crime, police would refuse to release any additional details about him. Two years after this information was relayed to authorities, in July of 2012, police would conduct a search at a home along the 800 block of South Hawthorne Street. This home belonged to a man named John William Black, who had been linked to another case from a different bowling alley. Tower Lanes in October of 2010. In that case, this man, Black, had apparently motioned for a three-year-old girl to come with him towards a nearby vehicle, where he claimed the child's mother was waiting. Fortunately for the child, and unfortunately for Black, the child's father had noticed this, and not only pushed Black to the ground, but proceeded to punch him in the face at least once. John William Black was later arrested and sentenced to 12 months in jail for the attempted luring, but according to Tika's mother, Teresa Lewis, this man had apparently claimed to see Tika on the night of her disappearance during his multiple interviews with police. This information would lead to investigators conducting a search of his home in July of 2012, and it was reported that three cadaver dogs would fixate upon a single location on the property. Police would conduct digs in the backyard and extensively search the home, but were unable to find anything of note. Weeks later, in August of 2012, Tacoma police spokesman Mark Fulgham would seem to clear Black as a suspect in Tika's case, stating that nothing significant was found to indicate his involvement. Other than the annual reminder of Tika's still unsolved case, which always came in January when Tika's family announced their yearly vigil at the scene of the crime, this would be the last news regarding this case until just recently. On the night of Tika Lewis's disappearance, Saturday, January 23rd, 1999, a young man had been at New Frontier Lanes with his family. This young man, who was 17 at the time and has chosen to remain publicly anonymous, recalled having an odd encounter with a man in the bowling alley. Speaking to Q13 Fox News in January of this year, 2020, he would recall, I had to use the restroom, so I went towards where the restrooms were. This rude guy bumped into me with his little girl, and he was white. The little girl was mixed. I just thought it was a father rushing his daughter to the restroom. At the time, this young witness had thought nothing of this encounter. He bumped into an older man who was apparently rushing his daughter to the bathroom, and that was that. Even later in the evening, when this witness went to leave with his family and they noticed police officers in the parking lot, they did not think anything was awry. Officers would not reveal why they were there, so the family just went on their merry way home. It wasn't until a few days had passed, and the story of Tika Lewis being abducted from the bowling alley began to spread throughout the region that this young man began to realize what had happened. He had possibly encountered Tika's abductor in the process of him carrying out the crime. Knowing that he had to reach out to police, this young man would reach out to investigators and speak with them. Being interviewed once in January of 1999 and providing a statement of his encounter with this strange man. This information would end up sitting in the binders of tips collected by investigators, where it languished for the better part of 21 years. It wasn't until just recently that Detective Steve Repley began to dive through the older tips, and that's when he stumbled upon this buried lead. Speaking to Q13, Detective Repley stated, This witness actually describes an encounter with Tika by this individual, and the description of the individual is not generic. It's specific, and it's detailed, and unique enough that the description can maybe identify the last person who maybe had contact with Tika. Within the past year, investigators would begin to reach out to this witness, who had been just a teenager at the time but now was a man grown. He was more than willing to repeat the information he had given to detectives two decades prior, and one word that really stood out to detectives was a descriptor used for the suspect 
which had been lingering close to the case for years now. The word pockmarked, a very specific and precise word, used to describe someone plagued with acne or other facial scars. If you recall, a witness had described a man with pockmarks hanging out near the bowling alley's arcade on the evening of Tika's abduction, but this descriptor carried some added weight because of an additional lead that Detective Rebelay was able to resurface. About a week or so after Tika's disappearance, the television show America's Most Wanted was filming a segment just outside of the bowling alley itself. As they were filming a reenactment of Tika's case, a group of onlookers began to gather to watch the filming. One individual there in the group would later tell police about strange behavior coming from another person present at the filming, a man with a pockmarked face whose behavior was so odd that it was worth reporting. At the time, police had not released any information about a person of interest with pockmarks, so this tip came in totally unprompted and was based solely off of the man's suspicious behavior at the time of filming. Using the information from these combined statements, it's believed that this was a white male between 30 and 40 years of age, who stood about 5 foot 11 with a slightly heavy set or husky build who had a thick mustache, shoulder-length curly brown hair, potentially a large nose, and of course, a pockmarked face. At the time of the abduction, he was supposedly wearing a blue plaid shirt and faded blue jeans, and may have been driving a maroon or purple Pontiac Grand Am. And because he seems to have appeared at the time America's Most Wanted was filming at the bowling alley, he was likely a local to the Oakland or Fircrest neighborhoods of Tacoma. While police have not named this individual a suspect or a person of interest in their investigation, he is being sought after for questioning, and may have been one of the last people to see Tika Lewis alive. Teresa Lewis, Tika's mother, says that police showed her a photo of a man who they believe is this individual, and she claims to remember seeing him at the bowling alley on the night of Tika's disappearance. She also believes that he, at one point at least, followed along with the case via a Facebook page that she set up to raise awareness for Tika's disappearance. Because of this, she no longer believes that Tika is alive, telling reporters with King 5 News, I remembered the guy from the bowling alley, and if that's the case, there's no way Tika is here right now. At the time of her disappearance nearly 22 years ago, Tika Lewis was two and a half years old and was last seen wearing a green Tweety Bird shirt, white sweatpants, and black and white Air Jordan sneakers. Her black hair, which had natural red highlights, was pulled back into a ponytail, and she was carrying a clear purse with a fish design, which was full of quarters and starburst candies. Tika had a couple of noticeable indicators, which, if she's still alive, can be used to identify her. She had a large birthmark on her left buttock, as well as patches of light discoloration on her face, which came about as a result of eczema. Her ears were already pierced at the time of her disappearance, and she had noticeable facial dimples. In addition to eczema, Tika had also been treated for asthma and allergies, which would likely be lifelong issues. Age progression photos of what she would look like now can be found online, and I'll also be posting them on the podcast website. On the one year anniversary of Tika's disappearance, her mother Teresa would extend a heartfelt message to her daughter, stating, Tika, mommy misses you. She loves you. Wherever you're at, there's not a day goes by that I don't think about you. I'll never give up the search for you. I love you, Tika. In the two decades since, Teresa has continued to live up to her word, and has been one of the few driving forces in this case, holding public vigils on the anniversary of Tika's disappearance every single year, and holding other events throughout the year, including Tika's birthday, the 4th of July. She's also provided DNA to genealogical websites in the hopes that Tika, perhaps still alive out there, one day attempts to find her own genetic heritage. In recent years, Teresa has begun to temper her expectations, believing that Tika might have died shortly after being abducted from the bowling alley. But her and Tika's father, Robert, continue to hold out hope that Tika will be returned to them at some point. At the very least, they hope that answers can be found in her case, and with the revelations from this year, 2020, they believe that they are closer than ever to finding out what happened to their missing daughter. With the 22nd anniversary of Tika's disappearance quickly approaching, it is encouraged that anyone with information reach out to Tacoma Police or call into Crime Stoppers at 1-800-222-TIPS 
Once again, that's 1-800-222-8477. As of this episode's recording, the story of Tika Lewis remains unresolved. Thank you for listening to this episode of Unresolved. This story is one that I've wanted to cover for a really long time, dating back to the earliest days of this podcast. All of the stuff that I talked about in the introduction is totally true. I grew up in the Tacoma region, and this story was big news there when it happened. Unfortunately, it never really picked up in the national press, so it would eventually just kind of putter out in the media. I was only 8 years old at the time, but I remember hearing about Tika's abduction and being horrified. At the time, I didn't really comprehend that stuff like this actually happened. It really did have a profound effect on me, and I continue to think about Tika pretty often. I can only hope for her and her loved one's sake that answers will be found soon. I have been your host, Michael Whelan. This episode of the show was researched, written, and produced by myself and the music throughout this episode was put together by yours truly through Amber Music. The song you're hearing right now is the Unresolved theme song, written and composed by Ilsa Traves. For a full list of sources and references, as well as a transcript of each episode, please head to the podcast website at unresolved.me to learn more. Now, I would like to take a moment to thank the producers of this episode, who support the show each month through Patreon. Ben Crocom, Gabriella Bromley, Quill Carter, Laura Hannon, Damian Moore, Amy Hampton, Scott Nisi, Stephen Wilson, Travis Sepko, Scott Patzold, Marie Vangeland, Astrid Nyer, Ime McGregor, Brian Hall, Sydney Scotton, Sarah Moscarotolo, Sue Kirk, Thomas Ahern, Marion Welsh, Seth Morgan, Joe Wong, Alyssa Lawton, Patrick Loxo, Kevin McCracken, Meadow Landry, Tatum Bautista, Michelle Watson, Tunya Elzinga, Ryan Green, Don Keller, Stephanie Joyner, Gravity Head Zero, Alyssa Hampton Dutro, Ruth Durbin, and Sally Ranford. Thank you all so much. If you would like to join these people and become a patron and get your name in the credits and hear digital exclusive bonus episodes and stuff like that, just head to patreon.com slash unresolvedpod. Once again, that's patreon.com slash unresolvedpod, or search for Unresolved Pod in the Patreon app. Lastly, I would like to just thank everyone for listening. I know that this hasn't been an easy year for anyone, but I am so grateful to anyone who continues to listen to this podcast and support the show in any way, no matter how big or small. If you can, please help keep spreading the word for this show and keep up on the iTunes reviews if you haven't already. They really do help. I'll be back with another new episode next week, but until then, I hope you all stay safe and stay healthy. Now, I'm going to play a promo for a podcast from some friends of mine, True North True Crime. This is a great podcast that covers Canadian true crime stories and it's really well done so far. Seriously, go check it out. It's a great podcast. I will talk to you all later. Hey, true crime fans. We're the hosts of True North True Crime. With today's 24-hour news cycle, it's easy for a murder or a missing person case to fall quickly out of the headlines. Victims still need a voice long after the media has stopped reporting about them. True North True Crime raises awareness for victims by telling their stories. So listen and subscribe to True North True Crime wherever you listen to podcasts. And stay safe, everyone. Stay safe, you guys.